the Sundarbans forest is the largest mangrove in the world, covering over 10,000 square kilometers between India and Bangladesh. It's a flooded forest, where the fresh water of two of the planet's most powerful rivers, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, and the salt water of the Indian Ocean come together. From this junction is born an inextricable network of saltwater canals that form an amazing ecosystem ruled by the mysterious Bengal tiger. For Bengalis, Sundarbans means beautiful forest. It provides them with the best protection against increasingly violent cyclones, but especially the forest is brimming with game, fish, crustaceans, and wood used for heating and building. The families who live here are entirely dependent on the forest and have always been mindful of the balance between their needs and what the land can offer them. But over the past few years, this balance has been seriously disturbed and the means to remedy it are lacking. Everything lies in the hands of local initiatives. How can humans re-establish the balance of this forest that is looked upon as a protective and nurturing mother by an entire people? For over a decade, Siraj al Hussein has been taking pictures of the mangrove. His photography documenting bird life in the Sundarbans is known throughout the world. His pictures reveal a mysterious universe. Here, over 300 varieties of bird live in an array of habitats dry forest, wetlands, mudflats, and sandy beaches. One of the Sundarbans' winged residents has captivated Sirajul's attention in particular. If anybody comes to Sundarban, the first thing will catch their eyes are the kingfisher. They are so beautifully, yeah, uh, they have beautiful color and they are very agile. They are very bold and strong birds. And almost whole day, they uh, stay on the branches and look at the canal, uh, catch fish. This canal is the kingfisher's territory, and the solitary creatures are on a mission to defend it against other members of their species. They dive into the river to hunt and spend so little time underwater that when they come back out, their impermeable feathers are never even wet. You can also hear a very strong uh, voice there in the forest. They are very beautiful to listen to. And that actually uh, gives you the sense that you are in Sundarman. Because I don't think anywhere else uh, you can hear so strong and so loud and beautiful bird song. But once we venture inland, the forest harbors an entirely different kind of wildlife. The mangrove forest is 114 million years old and for ages was completely free of human presence because it has great dangers in store for intruders. The shital, however, also known as the spotted deer, is harmless. It's one of the most common animal species found in the Sundarbans. There are some deer came to eat, a group of about 60, 70 deer. 
This place is full of with kevra trees. You can see around the all the trees. The lowest leaf are in the same line like a haircut. This is because the deers actually they climb uh, on their hind leg and eat all the leaves uh, as far as they can. Here uh, the deer sometimes they they have another companion, companion which is the rhesus macaques, the only uh, primate in this forest. This uh, kevra tree has a small fruit, you know, round fruit, which is very tasty to monkeys. But when they eat, they drop many of the leaves and many fruits they drop in the ground. And deer normally they follow monkey and they, they take the fallen leaves and fruit. And this is somehow a natural connection between the deer and the monkey. But the unusual symbiosis that has developed between the deer and the macaques is mainly useful for defending against the same predator. Those cries are the alarm signal for the entire forest. For Sirajul, this unparalleled predator arouses as much fear as fascination. Even after more than 10 years, he's only managed to snap its photo once an extremely rare picture worth more than all the rest. So we are hearing this deer call, and this was advancing. And then some monkey started to, you know, making noise. And so we were just thinking that something is happening. So we told our boatman who was rowing with his hand to go faster. We were just going through the canal. Slowly I saw a, a head came, came out you know, behind the bush and slowly going and swimming across the canal. I took some shots, some of my friends also took some shot and shot and that is that was fantastic. That day, Sirajul took a picture of a Bengal tiger, Panthera tigris tigris, the largest big cat on earth. It was really a good feeling because getting a tiger photo in the wild uh, is very rare and uh, I felt great, I felt great. The Bengal tiger is more than just the symbol of Bangladesh. It plays a major role in the equilibrium of the mangrove forest. Perched at the top of the Sundarban food chain, the tiger feeds mainly on herbivores, regulating their populations and indirectly maintaining the characteristics of the entire ecosystem. But the Bengal tiger also protects the Sundarbans from one of its greatest threats, humans, who for centuries steered well clear of the creature. Monirul Khan is hot on the tiger's trail. He's a biologist and studies the creature's habits and movements to ensure its protection. Bengal tigers are in grave danger of extinction. There are only about a hundred left in the Sundarbans. Like all wild cats, tigers hunt at dawn and dusk. They're practically invisible in broad daylight. Studying one of the largest predators alive comes with mortal risks. Monirul Khan never ventures into the mangrove without an armed guard. Professor, here are some droppings. I found some fur, look. Yes, those are tiger droppings. We see deer fur. These droppings are quite old. The fur tells us what the tiger ate. In the Sundarbans, we see very few tigers. I'm looking for the path this tiger took, the different behavioral signs that show us what it did, if it hunted, ate, rested, or walked about. Every track and sign a tiger leaves gives clues to its behavior. 
I'm noting this spot so I can locate it later on the map. These tigers have grown accustomed to the muddy, swampy climate of the Sundarbans and its forest environment. That's why they have no trouble swimming across a river that's two or three kilometers wide. Other tiger breeds can't swim that well. The Bengal tiger made this region its home 12,000 years ago and has perfectly adapted to the unique forest that grows here, half on land and half in water. The reigning tree here is also amphibious, the mangrove. There are a dozen or so varieties. Fazul Ok is a biologist. He spent his entire career working to understand the incredible mechanism that allows the mangrove to adapt to what no other forest can stand up to, tidal ebb and flow. This is a metaphor. You can tell from its shape which tree it's from. This is the pneumatophore of the Sundari mangrove tree. It's flat and very hard. The upper part is pointed. As it is flooded twice daily, the soil in the Sundarban mangrove is poor in oxygen. Mangroves have a unique and ingenious way of breathing. Pneumatophores, a kind of breathing tube that grow upward from their roots. When the tide's low, the trees breathe through the pores of their pneumatophores, called lenticels. At high tide, the lenticels close and trap the air inside the tree. The tree uses the oxygen and releases carbon dioxide into the water. Mangrove forests trap five times more carbon dioxide than other forests in the world. The mangrove's other amazing feat is that it's able to thrive in salt water. To cope with salinity, the mangrove filters out the salt, then absorbs the water. The tree then excretes the salt that's been filtered through its leaves. The ingenious mangrove has also managed to put the tides to good use for reproduction. Rather than run the risk of drowning or asphyxiating its seeds, they germinate directly on the tree. After getting swept by the currents at high tide, the seedlings fall and take root in the sludge at low tide. After that, everything happens fast. The tree's root system emerges in one day and the first leaves in less than 10. In two years' time, the mangroves are already several meters tall. This dense root system has an amazing attribute. It anchors trees in a particularly solid way, allowing them to act like a fence to slow down wind and water. 
Though they may not be able to stop a tsunami, mangroves can reduce the damage caused by the fierce cyclones in the Bay of Bengal. Mangroves offer precious defense for the entire country. But the mangrove forest is much more than a cluster of trees. What we have here is a complex and diversified food chain. Each living creature plays an important role. When the water recedes, it reveals a whole realm of curious creatures. Like the mudskipper, an amphibious fish perfectly capable of living on land during low tide. Its eyes are fully independent from one another, which not only gives it a broad field of vision, but allows it to see both under and above the water. But the true engineer of the mangrove is this guy, the crab. As an omnivore, it eats everything it can find, from mangrove leaves to dead animals. And in doing so, it recycles the ecosystem. Its larvae are the main food source for fish, and it aerates the sand with the long holes it burrows. The Sundarbans mangrove is brimming with crustaceans, fish, birds, and mammals, a real horn of plenty. The men and women who settled here some 200 years ago knew what they were doing. But in order to get their hands on the mangrove's treasures, they had to come to terms with its guardian, the tiger. For two centuries, only the most daring and destitute have braved this highly dangerous, yet nurturing and fertile environment. Its inhabitants have long led an existence in harmony with the resources the forest has to offer. Shukuma has been fishing since he was old enough to work. He lives in a small village in the mangrove forest. He uses traditional fishing methods with a net, like his father and grandfather before him. We're together in happiness and in sadness. We try to eke out a living from fishing, and we work to meet our family's needs. The harmonious balance Shukumar alludes to has been challenged the past few years. The numbers of fish are dwindling. The people in the heart of the forest are growing concerned. There aren't enough fish left to support a whole family. A lot of fishermen are giving up and heading to other regions. Those who stay have to venture deeper into the forest. Now, an entire day's catch is barely enough to live off for two days. We need to find a different livelihood in our village, or else go find work in another region. We needn't travel very far to figure out why there are so few fish. Here we are on the edge of the mangrove forest along the coast of the Bay of Bengal. During the five-month dry season, this temporary village bustles with 15,000 fishermen. The fish is dried for export. Tightly woven nets don't let anything through. Crustaceans, eggs, fry, 
everything is destroyed. The fish can't manage to reproduce anymore. So with the decreasing fish supplies, the entire country has turned to an activity that has proven lucrative, shrimp farming. In 20 years, Bangladesh has become the world's sixth ranking producer of shrimp. The country's second greatest economic activity after textiles. An El Dorado for families fleeing shanty towns and the instability of city work. At high tide, hundreds of fishermen retrieve their nets of shrimp fry, which they sell to farmers, who then place them in nursery ponds. But therein lies the problem. Shrimp farming is an ecological disaster. Abdul Chaudhuri is a professor of environmental science. For 20 years, he's watched the shrimp industry wreak havoc with the Sundarbans and completely reshape its landscape. There are a lot of shrimp in the Sundarbans, but there are too many producers, and that means over-farming. On the one hand, the fishermen manage to make a living by collecting shrimp, but on the other hand, they destroy other natural resources by catching the eggs and fry a fish endemic to the region. And the water kept in the ponds of shrimp farms in the villages is changing the quality of the soil and water. The water kills freshwater fish in favor of shrimp. Shrimp are farmed in saltwater ponds supplied with water from the canals. The soil is porous and lets the salt through, where it contaminates the reserves of fresh water needed for rice paddies, which are gradually disappearing. Drinking water in the villages gets polluted by the chemicals used in shrimp aquaculture. But most importantly, the mangrove's ability to absorb salt has hit its limit, and the trees are dying. The stabilizing action of the mangrove forest has been compromised, leaving coastal zones and villages vulnerable to destruction from frequent storms. If this continues, the Sundarbans are going to lose their natural resources, both in terms of animal and plant life. The mangrove ecosystem won't be the same, and the entire country of Bangladesh will suffer the consequences. Since the shrimp rush began, one million people have depended on the mangrove forest for their survival. They represent a massive drain on the forest's resources. The result? Unprecedented deforestation, a disturbed ecosystem, and tiger attacks. The tigers of the Sundarbans have been man-eaters ever since villagers have sprung up near their territory. To survive, a male tiger needs a surface area of 100 square kilometers. Deer, its prey of choice, is also hunted by humans, of whom there are more and more. Man and tiger. The mangrove has become too small for these two big predators. And tigers, which are excellent swimmers, are infamous for attacking fishing boats. Wait, I think there's a tiger print there. Go closer to that bank. To the right there? Closer. Yes, it's right there. I can't see very well, but there's something on the other side. Yeah, let's cross. The tiger that walked here is very big. 
The large circular print indicates an adult male. Now I'm going to measure it. 10 centimeters at the heel and in length 11.5 centimeters. An adult male weighing over 250 kilograms. We can also deduct how old the print is. The insect grooves tell us it's not recent. I'd say the tiger came by here about 24 hours ago. Tigers may have become manhunters, but humans in turn have become tiger hunters. The demand for products derived from the big cats is very high in Asia. Each part of the tiger, skin, teeth, bones, sells at a high price. Another threat comes from people living along the forest edge. When a tiger comes out of the forest, it gets killed. Three hundred and fifty thousand people work in the mangrove. Fishermen must venture deeper and deeper into the forest to find fish. Their only security against tigers, invoking the goddess Bonbibi, protector of the Sundarbans. Two years ago, Shukumal was fishing when he found himself face to face with a tiger. The tiger pounced on me. I didn't have time to protect myself. It sank its claws into my eye and chest. I lost a huge amount of blood. Part of my head was here, on my shoulder. Shukumal owes his life to the incredible bravery of his two sisters-in-law, who were fishing with him that day. I struck the tiger twice with a stick. The tiger let go and fled. I bound his wound with my sari. It was soaked with blood. She closed up my skull with her hand and held it in place with her sari. I couldn't abandon him. We'd gone there together and we would leave together. When we got back, the people who greeted our boat said, they saved him from the fangs of a tiger, something ten men couldn't have done. They're wild animals, but they protect our forest. Tigers kill people, but I don't believe they're angry at humans. It's probably our own fault. That's why. Like the tiger, there's another emblematic creature of the mangrove forest, the crocodile. Here too, increased human impact has had devastating effects. And while there used to be three varieties of crocodile in Bangladesh, today only two remain, the saltwater crocodile and the mugger crocodile. Look on this side, right there. A few years ago, Dr. Rashid, a reptile expert, launched a study to find out why crocodiles were disappearing. Go closer to the other bank. Closer, go closer. Get a little closer. We just saw a crocodile slip into the water. It's between two and a half and three meters long. Record its position with the GPS. 1127, GPS 408. 408. It's going under, it's going under. Hurry up. It went under, too late, it's gone. The saltwater crocodile is extremely sensitive to water quality and variations in their number is a good indicator of the health of the mangrove forest. Crocodiles are what scientists call a sentinel species. At one time, there were a great many crocodiles in the Sundarbans. But their number has consistently dwindled over the past 40 years. We're hoping to find an explanation for this through our study. 
There are several reasons. First of all, fishermen catch baby crocodiles in their nets and injure or even kill them. The second reason is environmental. Besides taking a census of crocodiles, we record water quality, its salinity and temperature. Over the past few years, salt water has taken the upper hand over fresh water. Salinity 7.52. And we've observed that crocodiles live in water with little salt. So there's a link between the increase in salinity and their disappearance. pH 8.3. The quality of the environment and climate have a direct impact on animal life in the Sundarbans. As with the tiger, the fate of the crocodile reflects that of the forest. Both suffer from too great a human impact. The equilibrium of the Sundarbans has been damaged. The government of Bangladesh has reacted by restricting access to the beautiful forest. From now on, one must have a permit to go there, which is difficult to obtain. Armed guards patrol the canals. Zaire Uddin Ahmed, director of the forest department, is in charge of reinforcing inspections. In some of the places, in 23% of this forest, there is no fishing allowed. It is kept for the breeding ground of the fish. Besides this, another 18 canals are entirely kept for the breeding ground of the fish. Armed patrols make the rounds of the canals. They're very thorough and strict especially when it comes to poaching. First of all, because the forest receives UNESCO funding to protect its tigers. And secondly, because pirates and smugglers often pass themselves off as fishermen. What's your name? David. Are you sure? I had some trouble, otherwise I'd be home already. All right, here you go. The man's fishing permit is in order. His boat contains nothing suspicious beyond a meager catch of fish, barely enough to feed his family. Zaeo Din Ahmed is aware that government inspections in the mangrove are not a sustainable solution. So this is one, so of, this our is one of our main challenges. How, how can we look into that? We cannot prevent, we cannot prevent a, a empty bellied people empty who have nothing. Once, need come, Once the need comes, come up. they obviously the come to the forest looking for what they need. That this is front of him. Keeping his child without Who would believe that if a child is hungry, if it is dying, that the, that the parents would not come here and take the resources? But the resources there, the people would not take it. But today, the mangrove faces an even greater affliction, global warming. The sea level is rising, washing even more salt into the mangrove, and storms are multiplying. On May the 25th, 2009, Cyclone Isla struck the southwestern coast of Bangladesh. The storm destroyed everything in its path. Embankments gave way, and water surged over the land. Villages, roads, livestock, rice fields, nothing withstood Isla. Nearly four million people were affected by the disaster. When the winds died down and the water receded, villagers were left to mourn 190 deaths.
For a long time, the mangrove forest was Bangladesh's best defense against frequent cyclones. But this time, it wasn't able to halt the disaster. The forest threw in the sponge. Climate change experts estimate that over a billion people will be affected by rising sea levels by the year 2060. Bangladesh is one of the five most vulnerable countries. Asim lives in one of the villages destroyed by the cyclone. He nearly lost his family on that fateful day. A lot of water came rushing into the village. I watched as old people, women, children and pets got swept away. My son was with my wife, and she refused to leave his side. I watched them get swept further and further away by the waves. I was really little. My mum and I got swept far away in the flood. I was so scared. The water kept rising. I lost sight of my father. I had no news of them for two days. In 20 years, the Sundarbans have changed so much. Today, it's a sad situation. But disaster is often a catalyst for change. After Isla and the destruction it wreaked, Asim decided to take fate into his own hands. His fate, but also that of the land he so loved. First, he educated himself about the harmful effects of forest exploitation. Then he shared what he learned with his fellow villagers. Next, he came up with an idea that would change everything planting an artificial mangrove forest to preserve the original one. And so several times a month, Asim goes from village to village, organizing mangrove planting operations. His mission, to reverse the devastating downward spiral poisoning the Sundarbans. You're going to do exactly as I do. First, Make a hole. The root is four inches. You have to make a three inch hole, then pack the earth around it. Does everybody understand? Take your time, go very slowly, treat the seedlings like you would your own children. As these trees grow, they'll protect us from flooding. They'll prevent the riverbanks from collapsing. When the trees are big, they'll also protect us from heavy winds. Our villages will be protected. In two years, they'll grow seven meters tall. They'll provide wood for us to burn. They will also give us fruit we can sell. With the money we earn, we'll be able to help poor families in our village and give money to parents so they can send their children to school and marry off their daughters. 
Ultimately, our goal is to never have to go back to the wild Sundarbans forest so that we don't destroy it. For us, the forest is like our mother, a mother who feeds her children and gives them all her love. In short, the forest allows us to live. That's why we have to do everything we can to preserve the forest and raise the awareness of those who live here. A little further on in the mangrove, these men have gathered to construct embankments to protect against rising water levels. In the 1950s, the Bangladesh government slaughtered 3,000 crocodiles in order to export their skins. Sixty years later, a sign of changing mentalities, the forest department funds a crocodile farm in the heart of the mangrove in order to reintroduce crocodiles into the Sundarbans. The first year they eat fish. After they grow a little bigger, we give them small pieces of meat. Currently, we have 262 crocodiles of different sizes and ages, newborns and two or three-year-olds. We also have three adult crocodiles in our center, Romeo, Juliet and Filfil. Last year, Juliet laid 51 eggs, of which 36 hatched. Filfil laid 61 and 38 of those hatched. As soon as they reach the age of seven or eight and are over two meters long, they'll be released into the Sundarbans. We have to protect crocodiles because they favor the presence of fish and guarantee the continuity of the food chain. The creator made man the superior species, so it's our duty to protect the crocodiles. Like the tiger in the forest, the crocodile is the super predator of the mangrove swamps. It holds the role of cleanup crew, eliminating weak and sick fish, thus ensuring the health of the ecosystem. Scientists have observed that there are fewer fish in places where the crocodile has disappeared. If the crocodile reintroduction program is successful, aquatic life as a whole in the mangrove should improve. The inhabitants of the Sundarbans and the government have also realized that the future of the mangrove forest comes with the education of their children. The main issue is, the education. The main issue is education. We think education can help us. If we do not give the local people proper education, one day a small boy will go with his father to the forest. But once this small boy has education, he will tell his father, please do not go. With the help of an international NGO and the cooperation of local people, the Ministry of Education has set up an education program in the schools of the mangrove forest. 
অনেক সুন্দর তাই না তাহলে কি মনটাকে আমাদের কি রক্ষা করতে হবে ভালোবাসতে হবে নাকি ধ্বংস করব সবাই ভালোবাসব সুন্দরবনে যে সব প্রাণী বাস করে তাদেরকে হত্যা করব না ভালোবাসব সুন্দরবন আর সুন্দরবন রক্ষা পেলে কারা বাসব আমরা বাসব ও সবাই মনে থাকবে এটা সুন্দর We adults don't know the Sundarbans very well, and that leads to the forest destruction. But if the children learn about the forest from a very young age, when they grow up to be adults, they'll love it and make sure to protect it. We've conveyed two main messages to them, the importance of the tiger and the mangrove. That's why we need to protect the forest. We also ask them to make a promise not to eat deer meat, for example, and to protect the Sundarbans. Each child signs with a handprint to mark his or her promise to protect the mangrove. In our own ancient culture, animals were part of everyday thing. You know, animals were very much connected with the psychology and the uh, emotional and spiritual feeling. Through photography and many other art forms, we are just trying that if that connection can be repaired and improvising the next generation that the nature is your part, is you are not something separate and you have to think together that we also live, all the animals also live and then only can Sundarban can be preserved or survived. The history of the Sundarbans is still being written. But a third of the mangroves have disappeared over the past 30 years. It's the ecosystem that's disappearing at the most alarming rate. And yet it's a formidable weapon to fight against what global warming holds in store for the future. Local communities have taken the forest into their hands. Will the forest's revival come about through the children of its fishermen and hunters? Though they may not hold the official title as such, these youngsters are no doubt the best guardians of the Sundarbans. <laughs>